Yeah, I don't know. I usually try and help everybody, share, share. So, to tell the story of the suicidal spider, just to walk you back. You know the story of the suicidal spider? <laughs> oh, there was the... Uh, somewhere in London, there was a little spider. It was just freshly born, made a beautiful little web in the corner of somebody's house. <coughs> and it made such a lot of effort, really mindful, very sort of diligent, and made this amazing web in the corner of somebody's house. And as soon as she was finished, she was exhausted. She sat in the, the middle of the web, waiting for lunch. And of course, lunch never came, because the owner of the house saw a spider in the corner of the room, and with the broom, whacked the web, and the spider had to run for her life. It came so close to it being killed. And so, what could you do? She had to go to the next house and build another web. And again, it was destroyed. A third house, the fourth house, the fifth house, the sixth house, the seventh house. And after seven houses, this poor spider was so exhausted and so hungry and so traumatized. It had post-traumatic spider system. <laughs> And it started thinking, nobody loves spiders. Why? I mean, spiders don't do any harm. You just want to spin a little web in the corner of your room. There's plenty of space for everyone else. And also, we just take the bugs which you don't want. We do a service for you. So you don't have to break your precepts. I break your precepts for you by getting rid of the bugs. But why do you hate me so much? And so the spider, it not, not only got traumatised, even the thought of building a web in somebody's house made it shake and had all these flashbacks of brooms and running for her life. <coughs> and so a poor little spider, she was walking down the road in London thinking, no one loves spiders, no one appreciates us, I'm homeless, I've got no place I can go. And everybody just, I'm so hungry and so alone. She became suicidal. And there was no helpline she could call. <laughs> no place she could go for refuge. And so she thought, this is hopeless. So she became suicidal spider. She decided to try and crawl under somebody's feet. Try and get squashed by them. But every time that she tried to walk under somebody's shoes. Always made the space between the, the heels and the sole. That didn't work. So she died, decided to cross the road and get squashed under a lorry. Always got between the tyres, they're actually underneath them. Because you know, sometimes you know, when you're really depressed, you can't do anything right. <laughs> <laughs> Not even suicide. <laughs> so poor suicidal spider was really, really, really depressed. And then she was walking down the road like a drunkard, driving around, not knowing where she was going. And that's when she felt someone looking at her. You ever had that feeling? You're walking down, minding your business, and think someone's looking at you. So she turned around, and she saw the fattest, happiest spider she'd ever seen in her whole life. And the big, fat, happy spider was looking at her, and said, why are you so sad? And that was the invitation for Suicidal Spider to tell the short, tragic story of her life. How she was born, went into a corner of a house and made a beautiful web and it was destroyed. And then another house and another house and life was so difficult. And every now and again, the big jolly spider had to get a tissue out to her so she could wipe her eyes as she was telling the sad story about what had happened to her. And when she came to the very end of her story, she said, no one loves me. And that's when the big, jolly, fat spider looked at her and said, well, you know, why didn't you come and stay with me? And the big, the suicidal spider looked at the jolly, 
fat spider and said, hey, how come you're not thin? How come you're so happy? Didn't people destroy your webs? He said, no. Big jolly fat spider said, I only built one web and it's still there. No one disturbs me. And there's plenty of food, but there's plenty of food for both of us. Why don't you come and stay with me? And the suicidal spider said, where in the whole of London can you build a web? Build and get lots of food without ever getting dis uh, disturbed. And the jolly fat spider said, oh, easy. I build my web and it's still there, I get plenty of food. I build my web in the donation box of the Buddhist temple. <laughs> <laughs> no one ever disturbed me. <laughs> but there's plenty of space here for the donations as well as the spider, don't worry. And with your eyes closed, With your eyes closed, just bring attention to how you are sitting on your chair to get yourself comfortable. Now you may assume that you are comfortable, but you can do better than this. So start by focusing on your feet on the floor. Do you need to move your feet further out from the chair, further in? Spread them out. How are they comfortable? If you do try to adjust your feet on the floor, you need mindfulness first of all, awareness of how you feel, just in that one area of your body. And also awareness of when you move them, whether it improves the comfort. Mindfulness allows you to have feedback. So you can feel whether you need to adjust. And that's the best position. Not only is this going to give you a comfortable posture to sit in, it's also going to mean that you are developing this awareness of kindness, mindfulness and compassion in your own body first of all. And build it up as you go through this very uh, quick body scan. So you go up from your feet to the rest of your legs. How do your legs feel now? Sometimes if there's some tightness or tension there, you can notice it. Zoom in on that area. You may have some pain or tension in your knees or in your thighs. Be aware of it. And if moving can help relax that part of the body, then just move, adjust. But when you are moving, adjusting that part of your body, always notice the feedback, whether you are more comfortable or less comfortable. And obviously, out of compassion, go for the most comfortable part. And sometimes, even if it's not moving it, you can focus on that part of the body and learn how to relax the tightness of tension in that part of the body. Sometimes parts of the body are just like stretched, like a guitar string is stretched under stress. You can imagine just loosening both ends of the guitar string. viewing the muscles in your body, relaxing them, loosening them, and being aware of how it changes the feeling in that part of your body. You're aware. Is that the best position for your back now? If you do move, adjust, you find it's unimproving. <coughs> Now you can go to your hands. How is your hands positioned? Can you maintain that position comfortably for the next 20 minutes? 
So you focus awareness on little parts of the body. Learn how to relax them. So there's no tightness in that part of the body at all. Everything is loose and open and free. Then you can go up the arms to especially your shoulders. People do have aches and pains in their shoulders because of tightness. So I often imagine both sides of my spine, the shoulders, a whole bundle of strings being stretched on each end. I imagine just letting go of those ends. I can feel the muscles in my shoulders. They relax too. Can I go up to my neck? Feel the sore neck or my cough? Sometimes it's due to allergies, hay fever, colds. So if it's inside the throat, you can do a lot just by focusing on that area and giving it massive amounts of kindness. A big dose of vitamin C, vitamin compassion. To your own throat. <coughs> there we go. It works. Thank you. And then we go up to our face. The face is a good indicator of your emotions. If you are tight, tense, angry, depressed, you can see that on the person's face. So you can relax, aware of those muscles and any tightness. See what you need to do <coughs> to relax the muscles around me, the mouth and the arms and the forehead. Because you do notice, again, the feedback principle. You notice whether the tightness gets loosened or it gets more time. Find what works, how to relax parts of your own body. To roughly the center of your brain. Imagine the tightness, the tiredness as well, of your poor brain, which has had to work so hard. Imagine that loosening, relaxing, nothing pulling or stretching your brain. Imagine it like the rest of your body, relaxing to the mind. Now you can be aware of your whole body sitting here. At ease. Relax as much as you possibly can. If you want to go back to one part which is still irritating, please do so. <coughs> See if you can get a more relaxed. <coughs> and at any time during this meditation, it's fine to cough. You cough straight away. It's finished with. If you plug it up, you get what we call in meditation a volcano effect. You really plug it up. In peace. It's called letting go. Thank you.
verses it comes in, wherever, however it comes in. And just know it as it goes out. <coughs> Focus on the peace answer and then how to direct it. You find the problem straight off because you know it. You're very peaceful and happy. You don't need to think. You don't fight the thoughts. find the cause behind them, the lack of contentment, the lack of inner peace, the lack of inner happiness. Thank you. 
results of Bolivia all get a bit creaky. <laughs> sitting down for half an hour, and if you came in earlier, I just get to myself. Okay, so it makes it much easier to actually to listen to the talk. Okay, what well, then, is that Australian time, or is that in the standard summer time? <laughs> So the title of today's talk has something to do with, with uh, not me, not mine, not a self. It's one of those teachings of like emptiness, anatta. But I always like to start off with a Buddhist joke because in order for the Dhamma to be able to uh, accommodate itself especially to Western culture. In Western culture, humour is an important part of teaching. So, uh, we have the three characteristics of existence, the anicca, dukkha, anatta. You know those ones? Anatta is not self, dukkha, suffering, anicca, impermanence. So, anicca, dukkha, anatta, walk into a pub. <laughs> That, that's, that's culturally appropriate to the land in which we are sitting. <laughs> Anicca, dukkha, anatta, that's that impermanence, suffering and non-self. Walk into a pub. And dukkha says, this pub sucks. <laughs> Anicca says, don't worry, it will change. Anatta replied, who said that? <laughs> but there's nothing wrong with being silly. Because sometimes why a thing so serious? So sometimes it's wonderful if we can let go, which is part of not me, not mine, not the self business. So I don't know about uh, the management of this joint, but I've got many places which I'm supposed to be managing over in Australia and other places too. And you know, it can be quite stressful. It's okay for you. You just come in here, listen to a nice talk, you go out afterwards. Wonderful. Same with me. I'm just a, well, they call it Australia, a blow in. Come in from Australia <coughs> and about another 10 days time go away again. In Western Australia, I call them uh, McFarms. Then, what else do we have? Oh yeah, and then over in Victoria, Sydney, and so forth. And then you've got the overseas ones, and so many stuff. So, there came a time when I would go to our <coughs> centre in Perth on the weekend. Teach, 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 teach all day. And sometimes it is all day. And then you go back to your monastery, and then teach, 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 teach. So I had two main jobs a weekend job and a sort of a weekday job. And the other people don't get paid. That's the worst part of it. <laughs> so being a monk or a nun, it's just, the, the, the pay is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a, I, I like sort of confronting stories. There's this man, his name, he's from Yorkshire, his name was Ted. He was in a local hospice in Australia with cancer, he was dying, like cancer, I think. And uh, basically just admitted to die, five or six days at most. And then he told me that the, the nurse came in one evening and said, what do you want to have for dinner tonight, Ted? And he said, well, look, I've got diabetes, I can't have anything sugary. He said, and I've got sort of um, uh, cholesterol, high cholesterol, I can't have anything oily. And I've got hardened arteries, I can't have anything salty. He went down like this, 
And the nurse was looking at him and said, Ted, what are you talking about? You're not going to die of cholesterol or diabetes or heart failure. You're going to die of cancer in about five or six days. You can eat whatever you want. <coughs> and Ted's eyes apparently went, why? <laughs> what? I can eat all this oil, <coughs> syrupy, salty food, which I haven't been allowed to eat for years? Yeah, go for it. So Ted had some of his favourite delicious unhealthy foods, so they said unhealthy, which he hadn't been allowed for years and years and years. You know what happened? About six days later, he walked out of that hospice in remission and another six months before he had to return again and die properly. <laughs> <laughs> The worry was killing him. Remember that even with food and exercise, it's not just the body, it's also the mind and the heart as well. One of my icons I always try to live up to, someone I knew when I was young, who was just always so kind, so generous, someone I really looked up to, and I thought, you know, I would like to, to be like this very spiritual person when I grow old. <coughs> and you know, he was old when I was young, and he's still alive today. It's amazing. And always healthy, always happy, always um, so generous. And I've seen him here in, in London recently. Santa. <laughs> Santa Claus. Jolly, happy, and fat. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> let's go back to Adam and move on to something. Oh, being a visitor. Being a visitor, message your worries. Be a visitor to your family. This body doesn't really belong to you. It does belong to nature, not to you. And if you're a visitor to this body, you make the best use of it. You're always ready to let it go when it's time to let it go. A doctor. I saw one of the little photographs of him, and going to old photographs, when he was a young kid. Uh, offering stuff to the monks. And a very bright young man, did well at school, went to university, became a doctor. And when he graduated, he started working uh, in the hospitals. Very brilliant fellow. But the day came when he came up to me and he said that he had to resign. He said he couldn't carry on being a doctor any longer. And I was wondering why. He was still young. It was only about two years he'd been a doctor. And he said to me that that very morning, <coughs> one of his patients had died tragically. It was a young woman of about 23. The death was unexpected. It wasn't his fault, but he felt so guilty, especially when he had to be the one to have to tell her husband. who was still in the, in the beginnings of their marriage together that the wife, the one he chose above all others, the one he loved so much, had died. And as if to rub salt into the wound, as the saying goes, with <coughs> two young children and no mummy. And it was unexpected. And that just, you can imagine, just the shock and the desperation and the why of that young family. And he felt responsible. And he said, I can never do that again. I can never be the one who says that terrible news to this 
little family. It broke him. So he said, I have to resign. And that's where I mentioned to him something else more important. This is also part of not mine. He felt responsible. It was his fault. So instead I told him that you misunderstood the purpose of being a doctor, being a nurse, being a therapist, being a counsellor, or just being a good friend. Your purpose is never to cure. You'll never be able to succeed. Temporary cures may be, but most of the time you'll come across diseases and problems which don't have a cure. If you think that curing is your purpose in life, you will fail many times. And you will go through the same tragedy and pain because you couldn't cure them. <coughs> the job of the doctor is not to cure the patients. Just change one letter. The job is to care for them. If you care for your patients, you care for your friends, you care for your family, you never need to fail. You can't always cure them. You can always care for them. And if you make caring more important than curing, number one, you're not trying to control people anymore. You're caring for them. And also, you're not trying to demand they get better. <coughs> you're not kind of trying to, to force them to change their ways. You're caring for them. You will always be a success. You can always care. And imagine how that will change the outcomes. If you make care of one more curing, you will find that even if somebody does die, they die having been cared for. And that changes the whole picture. How many times at the end of life do people have these, these very intrusive interventions trying to keep people going for a little bit longer? Because curing is far more important than our modern society to care. How many times do you have a relationship with somebody and try to cure your partner of their bad habits? What happens? <laughs> they get worse. <laughs> you try and care for them. And then those habits tend to get less. By caring, you're not controlling or owning. You're the opposite, being kind, compassionate, free. So, I care for the monastery which I live, but I don't own it. If you know the difference there, if you know the difference to having a place, where you can enjoy it. You can enjoy being the boss. You can enjoy being the head of Anna Kumpa. Because you're caring for it. Never trying to cure all the different problems which will come up from time to time. If the UK government would care <coughs> rather than curing all the problems of the economy, the problems with crime, the problems with Europe, the problems with everything. Cure, care, instead of curing. And you get people working together. So your body does belong to me, but I care for it. But I will try and cure it. Oh, right, that's after itself. Let go. So anyway, we started the meditation by caring for your body, letting it go. Realizing you don't control this body. It's not yours. It belongs to nature. My job is just to care for it. Next, even my uh, what else are you proud of? Not just your body, but also your intelligence. You know something that I'm already in decline. I'm already over the hill. Even all the stuff which I used to know, I don't know anymore. 
and so more and more my disciples are catching me out. And so fun. The Buddha never said that. <laughs> it doesn't matter. You know what the wonderful thing is? It's okay to be wrong. What a wonderful thing that is. To actually admit your faults. And also not to be embarrassed or ashamed when we make mistakes. Why is it that people have got such big egos and pride? They know they've made a mistake, but they will not admit it. And of course you come across that, you know, just in, in uh, relationships, in life, people will not back down. Which is part of, they think they own their intelligence, and they own their sort of being right. Sometimes I don't wonder, why is it that people argue? One of the reasons is, is because we were taught, I was taught anyway, go back to school, that if you make a mistake, there's something terribly wrong with you. You're not allowed to make a mistake. Do better next time. Come home earlier. Don't say the same stupid thing. And we're so afraid of making mistakes that we don't admit them anymore. So, as if we, we're not allowed, we have to own our being rightness. There's nothing wrong with being wrong. It's quite nice being wrong, we know anything. <laughs> so, my big mistakes, what are the sort of things which I've done wrong? I've, oh yeah, I don't know if I... One of my big mistakes which I made was, um, you know, that in Buddhism we have to go and do some chanting every now and again, and just to help people. It was just like football. You go chanting for your football team. It actually helps. You know, you can do better. Otherwise, you know, why do you have home games and away games? So, it works for football teams, so maybe it might work for temples. Go, Bermondsey! <laughs> but, there's also when people go and they get sick. You do a bit of chanting, that's actually just. Uh, encourage them, give them inspiration. We've also got another deeper level as well, <coughs> a bit of a sub psychic sort of stuff. And I remember just this there was this um, Chinese family, and their patriarch was really sick in the ICU in a coma. So they asked me to go do some charting for them. And the family had come over from, from Hong Kong and Singapore and uh, Taiwan. And so I went into the ICU and I really did some really full on charge. Give me everything I've got. All power. Zap, zap, zap. The Buddhist charge. Oh, I really gave it you know, 100%. And it worked. The fellow actually came out of the coma. And it started getting better. And that is when the shit hit the fan. <laughs> the other thing. <laughs> and straight away, if anybody ever complains that Mark should not use the shit word, I will point out to you, it's, it's in the Buddha's teachings, that you should teach in the local language. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> So what happened was, it started getting better, and that's when the whole family really started scolding me. He <coughs> said, now we've, we've already arranged a funeral service, <laughs> said, there's no possibility of them getting better. And they've already arranged a funeral service, everybody had come from overseas, <laughs> they did drive off their businesses, fly all the way, all this way, and now because of you, Atta Club, your Buddhist charity, now we have to go back again, cancel the funeral, and we've got plenty of to come back in six months when he dies again. <laughs> We're not going to invite him. Because I told him, look, you should have told him beforehand what type of charting you want. <laughs> they get better charting, or they die peacefully charting. <laughs> <laughs> so if you ever 
whatever what the Venerables here today are charting for you, please ask to watch what do you want. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know what you The happy marriage or get divorced quick charge. <laughs> make this day. Nothing, nothing wrong with being wrong. It's being human. Now that is something which is also part of oneself. <coughs> you have an ego. It's very fixed. And you can't change. You can't be wrong. You can't make mistakes. That's not who you are. You have to be the expert. You have to be the beautiful. You have to always be, be the champion of the world, whatever it is. That's part of the self which causes us a lot of suffering. So one day you're right, this is my being right day, tomorrow is my being wrong day. <laughs> Otherwise, it's also we're not innovative either. We're afraid of making mistakes because it might hurt our sense of self, our ego. No innovation, no courage, no daring, no trying to do something a bit different, just to see. Many times you may fall on your face as you make a mistake. Now you get lots of experience, it's called forward failing. You're not afraid, because you don't have to always be right. You don't always have to be successful. You'll always be learning growing, innovating. So when we have a very fixed fear of thinking of ourselves, not a fear of failure, we always tend to want to, to, to live up to what the people expect of us. So in prison we're not free anymore. Because sometimes your sense of self is what other people impose on you. Who you're supposed to be. That's not what a monk should be doing. That's not what a girl should do. That is not what, I don't know, what a politician is supposed to do. But sometimes you just do it. See what happens. Because it feels right at the time. You're coming from the heart. Not from all these ideas of who you're supposed to be. All these measurements. This is where a lot of the sense of self and mind is. And people measure themselves by how much they possess. How much do you earn and control? How many degrees have you got? When I was in Cambridge, I had this very wonderful graffiti. Exams killed by degrees. <laughs> <laughs> and the eminence of a great scientist, this was at the Cavendish Laboratory, the eminence of a great scientist is measured by the length of time he or she stops progress in their field. The bigger their ego, the more they stop progress in innovation. And the sense of self is an obstacle. So anyway, what we actually do is um, learn how to not measure ourselves. <coughs> now we live in a society, even in London, apparently there's more CCTV cameras than in London than even in China, or is it China over Why have we got CCTV cameras everywhere? Measuring, getting biometric data, getting all sorts of data, judging. Measuring so many things. <coughs> Someone asked me about that many years ago because they were referring to one of the founders of the um, Industrial Revolution here in England, a fellow called Lord Kelvin. Any engineers here will know Lord Kelvin was the person who, whose name now stands on the Kelvin scale of temperature which is by far the most logical. Zero is absolute zero. I think 273 degrees uh, uh, Kelvin. 
sorry, no, 273 degrees uh, Kelvin is, uh, is um, 0 degrees centigrade. So this was a, a logical um, temperature scale because he was somebody who was saying that if you want to control nature, you have to learn how to measure her accurately first. I don't know why they use the female gender for nature there. But anyway, that's what he said, it's quite. Learn to measure, and then you will be able to control. And that was the start of the Industrial Revolution, industrial revolution where we had to have good, accurate clocks to measure time. Accurate uh, measurements of the kilogram, apparently they just changed it, just adjusted it. No one will ever notice it. Standard weights and measures and time, because once you can measure things, then you can control them. Now let's see, that's philosophical <coughs> understanding, scientific knowing that this is what you need to do to control nature. But it also means we can use that to control people as well. We can control ourselves. What happens if you stop measuring? If you stop measuring, there's no way of controlling it. You have to let go. Compassion is not measuring. May I be happy and well, no matter what. May I be at peace, no matter what. The door of my heart is open to all beings, all traditions, all genders, no matter what. Not to measure. When people ask, I said, Brahma, you might be young, tell me about what tradition are you? I change from day to day. <laughs> and it should look all right. I'm not going to be measured. If I have a tradition at all, a Buddhist tradition, you know what tradition it is. You try, first of all, just you know, try and amalgamate, join things together, for goodness sake. Stop separating stuff. So I decided to take the H from Hinayana, the Aha from Mahayana, and the Yana from Vajrayana, to put them all together. And that became my tradition. I think you want to call it Amazon. <laughs> so it wasn't my tradition, I think I just joined it. <laughs> Stuff. So I decided to take the H from Hinayana, the Aha from Mahayana, and the Yana from Vajrayana, to put them all together. And that became my tradition. I think you want to call it Amazon. <laughs> so it wasn't my tradition, I think I just joined it. <laughs> Mahayana. 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 Why are we measuring, trying to put walls and barriers between people? And between wisdom? And between, I don't know, truth? Because measuring is something which the sense of self wants to do. I am better, I am worse, I am the same. The three Buddhist conceits. When I saw that, I thought, wow, that's really cool. Are you better than others? Are you worse? Everyone the same? How many of you were Monty Python fans? Monty Python, you know, you are Python. Now, it came to my mind again recently because <laughs> <laughs> they. Oh, I've got time, okay, I'll finish up soon. It's not my fault. <laughs> <Stop using it. laughs> so, anyway, the, the fellow who was one of the main writers of Monty Python, especially in the life of Brian, Eric Idle. Eric Idle, he was the one who um, uh, wrote and sang this song, Look on the Bright. You know, in many Buddhist uh, funeral services, now that's actually played a lot. <laughs> it's, it's one of the few religious movies which monks were allowed to watch. <laughs> <laughs> and in that movie, the, 
uh, there was um, Bly, who was supposed to be the Messiah. And so they asked his mother, and they said, is, is Bly, you know, is he the Messiah? He said, no, he's just a naughty boy. <laughs> Remember that, right? Yeah, so the Vice Chancellor of Adelaide University, when Eric Idle was an awarded, just a couple of weeks ago, he was awarded an honorary PhD by, um, by Adelaide University. Great PR, just you know, avoid somebody who's famous for PhD. And of course, you get the newspapers going there, and the, 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 uh, the media. And so the Vice Chancellor, in his, his dedication speech, said, well, actually, he's not really a PhD. He's just a still a naughty boy. <laughs> Be kind to them. Pardon, the door of my heart is open to you, no matter how I measure you. I'm talking about my measure you. Are you measured? Yes, sir. Of course you are. Do you stack up? No, there's always lots of faults. Do you measure yourself? How good are you? It's one of the nice things about non self. I'm not able to measure you. Who the heck am I? Am I a good man, a bad man? Am I just, am, am I lightened? Or am I just a naughty boy? I'm going to leave you there. Look at this, that, that whatever you aspire for in life, you can see it, it's right in front of you, you go towards it, and it moves away from you. Whether it's perfect relationship, Enlightenment, peace, meaning, you see it. You go towards it and it moves away. Like the donkey and the carrot. And the donkeys used to spend their whole lives chasing carrots and die before they ever got one. All the things which you know, it's right in front of you, but enough money, enough uh, good uh, respect from your colleagues, whatever else you measure and think is important in your life. You ever seen this right there in front of you, move towards it and move away? Just almost get there, but never quite. But then one day, a donkey was just uh, tethered outside the temple of emergency, and he heard the dumber <laughs> and found out how to catch carrots. Very easy when you figure it out. The donkey was running after the carrot as fast as he possibly could. Just like people in London, chasing the buck, chasing fame, chasing fortune, chasing disciples, whatever else you're chasing. And the more you chase them, the more distant they are. But this time, the donkey decided to stop. To let go. Stop measuring. Just be. So the donkey stops. What happened to the carrot? That carrot swung further away from the donkey. One four foot in front of the donkey's mouth. And the donkey just stood there. And the carrot, at the end of its trajectory, started swinging back towards the donkey. And soon that carrot was in its normal position, two foot in front of the donkey's mouth. But this time, travelling at high speed towards the donkey's mouth. And soon it swung right back. Didn't chase it, only been chasing for too long. Just stopped, the cat went far away, came right back again, and the last thing it needed to remember, it's not just stillness and stopping, it's also kindness, compassion. So just before the cat had hit the donkey's teeth, the donkey thought, compassion. <laughs> Carrot, the door of my mouth is open. <laughs> <laughs> now, measuring afterwards involves responsibilities in business. I'm not good enough. The world is not good enough. There's a space for that. But there's a time especially for you. You say, I'm not good enough. I'm not successful enough. I'm not healthy enough. I'm not happy enough. I'm not enlightened enough. And we stop. That's a special to meditation. Stop. And when you don't measure even progress in your meditation, 
You don't own your meditation, you don't own your mind. And you don't own your body, just be a visitor. A visitor to your idea of yourself, and that makes you it. Then you become so peaceful. Are you good? Are you bad? If you stop measuring, you just are. And all your perceptions, which you don't often take from others, have never been good enough, never been successful enough, never been beautiful enough, never been healthy enough. All those vanish. And when they vanish, you stop chasing things. When you stop chasing things, all the things you wanted to chase and achieve, they come to you. It's pretty radical in this teaching. You don't strive. You stop. <coughs> Striving comes from measuring, controlling. Stopping. Please, kindness. Kindness to yourself. I'm really good enough. So I really, I really bristle against self-improvement. Who the hell told you you're not good enough anyway? You need to improve. <laughs> How do they know? So you're good enough. Are you? You believe me? A lot of times people come to places like this. What was that story about the person who went to the bookshop and they asked the person on the counter, can you please tell me where is the self-help section? And the person on the counter said, so if I told you, it would defeat the purpose. Self-help, come on, I love yourself. And even worse, self-improvement. It's always also all predicated on measuring and say somehow you're not good enough. And you believe that. And then the life is this is not good enough. And to overcome that, that so people the simile of the forest. <coughs> then you get so much wisdom living in forest or jungles like London. <coughs> See how people behave, how they live. For this particular case of living in a forest, you know, all those years I've lived as a forest monk, now I live in a forest over in Australia. I've never, ever, ever seen a perfect tree. Not in the conventional sense of perfect, in dead straight, with all the branches equally placed, with all green leaves, no yellow leaves or brown leaves, and no leaves which have been munched by insects. No uh, trees which have been damaged by the storms or the fires. I've never seen a perfect tree. Not in the sense of, you know, undamaged. And in fact, we're not diseased. And in fact, if I did, I don't think I'd appreciate it. My favourite trees in the forests are the ones which are all twisted and bent. Which have got lots of yellow leaves and brown leaves and where? Because of the storms, many big branches have fallen off. In the holes, that's where the birds, or in Australia, things like possums, that's where they, they made their nests. Without those, they'd be homeless. All the twisted ones and bent ones, and all these little cankers and bumps on their, their trunk, that's what makes them look beautiful. The damaged ones. So I remember telling a group of people who had been traumatised by life, if you are damaged goods, number one, you belong. You belong to this beautiful forest called humanity. And number two, this is one of my favourite trees. The twisted, the bent, the damaged ones. Just stop trying to improve yourself. Embrace yourself as belonging. It doesn't need to be fixed up. It just needs to be appreciated and loved. That's how we stop measuring.
what was it like, you know, the, for the uh, LGBTQIA plus, those are the ones which I learned in Australia. How does it feel? What was it like being gay 20, 30 years ago? There's something wrong with you. It can be fixed. How many times do people feel that? So many different parts of their life. And I'm not saying that's good, I said that's really ridiculous, that causes so much harm. Measuring. My problem measuring, never being good enough, never being good enough, leads to more control. There's so much problems. Schizophrenia. I am very happy to say that you've got, you know, this, three clinical schizophrenics as monks in the monastery in Australia. I'm wondering how to deal with if you have bad habits that damage yourself or others or addictions ah. and not wanting to change. Not wanting to change, because sometimes people are forced to change. Why do people have addictions? <laughs> One of the things is that you know, the lack of self-worth, they feel so bad about themselves anyway. So they them feel, feel more bad about themselves. It just makes it worse. Addictions, say in London on the grown, or are they anticipating getting less? <coughs> what are we doing with addictions? Whether it's ice, alcohol, other sort of stuff which people get addicted to. Why? Something is going wrong there in our way of understanding what these things are and why they keep on happening. So many times, uh, because maybe it's my job, that I get a lot of people actually talking in depth about <coughs> their addictions. Nothing seems to be working that much. But one of the great ways is being associated with good people even associated with fellow recovering addicts. And you find there's nothing wrong with you. That's the first thing, to stigmatize. To stigmatize a person, that just reinforces that they're not good enough and they get more addicted. Maybe give up one addiction and get another one in this place. <coughs> Escaping, even like things like um, the Buddhist sense of meditation, thinking. I just mentioned that. The biggest problem when people try to meditate, I try to meditate, I think too much. My thoughts are all out of control. <coughs> Why? <coughs> are they really out of control? Yes. No one can control thinking. Controlling causes more thinking. Let it go. Be kind. Then it stops. <coughs> and even better, I was born in London, English, so as soon as, in those days anyway, my generation, as soon as you were weaned off your mother's milk, you were on cups and tea. <laughs> <laughs> and this was smack bang up in the mountains in the middle of a tea plantation. Heaven! <laughs> as much tea as I could possibly want to drink, and Beautiful caves, cool climate, good food, no one bothering you. This was the perfect place to meditate. You know what happened after three or four weeks? I started to have so many thoughts. And the thoughts got worse and worse. And the more I tried to control them, the worse they got. And they weren't just ordinary thoughts. These were what I called unmonkish thoughts. <laughs> Why does that old girlfriend still remain with me? It's not a magic box. Because I was only 29 at the time, and I was still sort of young and prepared. Good degree, I can do anything sort of stuff. But now I want to be a mouse. Shut up. I wonder if that one is around. I know, shut up. Then it started getting all this romantic fantasy, and I watched it, I was going crazy. And then I just went up to the shrine. There was a Buddha statue there. I just bowed to the Buddha and asked for help. And I got an inspiration. Do a deal. Mr. Trump was 
quiz at this one, do it again. <laughs> and the deal was this. It made sense to her, you know, a Western mind. For all the day I would be a good monk, I would just play, you know, watch my breath, be good, fine. For the next hour, I could watch every breath without missing one. <laughs> And what's going on? When I let go, my mind said this one. When I control, in those words, the monster grew bigger and more frightening and more ugly and more smelly and more violent. And every unkind word, unkind uh, act, unkind thought even, the monster was bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And by the time that Her Majesty came back into the palace, this monster was so huge, like a fellow called Jabba the Hutt, ugly and yucky, and the stench, the smell coming off the body of this monster in the Queen's throne in Buckingham House. Buckingham House. The smell was so bad that even the maggots crawling on his skin, even they vomited. <laughs> as soon as the Queen, Her Majesty, came in, all of her training, her wisdom, all of her good karma to make it as a queen. She knew straight away what to do. She said to this terrified monster, Welcome. Thank you so much for dropping by. Has anyone offered you a cup of tea? <laughs> we have many types of tea in this palace. We have uh, oak grain, we have Darjeeling, we have uh, We've got green tea, we've got all sorts of tea here. And those who see it, has anyone got your sandwich yet? You have cucumber sandwiches. You <laughs> <laughs> still have like cucumber sandwiches, not that unusual. Anyway, <laughs> what do you want? And, and that sincere act of kindness, the monster started growing smaller. The smell got less, the violence got less, and the happiness got less. And that made all the people in the palace. So here's a question. I'll get to the last question. <coughs> Can an enlightened being decide to come back for the benefit of the disciples? Can an unenlightened being... No, enlightened. An enlightened being decide. Not even an unenlightened being can decide for themselves. <coughs> We all go according to causes and effects, condition, brainwash, by our culture, by our teachers, by our understanding. Basically, we may think we have a choice, but we don't. Not even enlightened beings. Enlightened beings don't have a choice at all. Okay, uh, I have to back in the premises, otherwise, we get to come. <laughs> the master said to the disciple, the disciple said, can you give me some quick advice because I'm going down? He said, never argue with an idiot. <laughs> and the disciple said, that's not compassionate. The master said, yeah, I agree with you. <laughs>